On this episode, we drop in on the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. Then we talk with the San Francisco Municipal Railway about improvements to trolley stops. We head south to San Jose, where traffic calming makes neighborhoods safer. We also talk with the police about pedestrian safety for school children. Back east in Maryland, we look at an intersection where a pedestrian signal included in the blueprints wasn't installed. And finally, Keith Bartholomew talks about making the land use, transportation, and air quality connection. Stay tuned. We're talking with Dave Snyder, who's executive director of the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. When did the coalition get started? Uh, 1971. A fellow named Jack Murphy got it started. And what was your major accomplishment for the 1970s? We got opened what is the Bay Area's most popular recreational activity. Uh, a street in Golden Gate Park was closed to cars and made available to people to roller skate, to bicycle, uh, walk with their, their kids in strollers and whatnot. Uh, 40,000 people on a good day, on Sundays, uh, used that street. So what happened in the 1980s then? In the 1980s, the organization was dormant, relatively. It's the 1990s now. You're obviously back. 1990s. We uh, were reformulated in 1991. Uh, we started off with 25 or so members in 91, and now we have 1,700. We are working on uh, proving uh, to politicians that, that the, the needs of people who bike are, are, are urgent enough that they need to, to provide space, even if that means taking away a little space from motor vehicles. Here in San Francisco, unlike a lot of places, it's not that easy to strike a bike lane. Uh, the street's already full of lanes. Uh, there's, no, there's no space to put in a bike lane. So, so in order to, to, to get that bike lane, we have to uh, make the point not to the engineers, but to the policymakers that safety is a priority in our city, that people deserve the choice to bike if they want, uh, that, that, um, that tens of thousands of people uh, already bike and tens of thousands of people um, would if it were safe to do so. Speaking of tens of thousands of people, uh, this year critical mass has made the news. And critical mass is not the same as the coalition, but what is critical mass? Yeah, it's um, started in 1992. It's uh, something of an a organized coincidence. Uh, the last Friday of every month, people who bike show up at Justin Herman Plaza to go for a bike ride, basically. It's that simple. And it's done uh, mainly for fun. There's a lot of political import that it has. And a lot of people try to ascribe a particular, a, a particular political agenda to the ride. But they're missing the main point, which is that it's fun. In San Francisco, uh, in most cities, when you ride your bike alone, uh, it's fun unless you have to deal with lots of traffic. Well, in San Francisco, you always have to deal with lots of traffic. And so, although it's still the best way to get around for thousands of people, uh, it's not nearly as fun as it could be. Because you've got to be hyper alert. You don't get to pay attention to how beautiful the, the architecture is or the beautiful views because you are looking out for traffic all the time. Get together with a few of your friends, fill the street with bicycles, and it's a different story altogether. The street suddenly is quiet. Uh, you can you can smell the trees instead of the you know the the blossoming trees instead of the exhaust. Uh, you can you can hear your friend's conversation instead of the roar of engines by. The, the sidewalk environment suddenly becomes uh, downright pleasant instead of instead of a little fringe area next to this this roaring highway. Um, you know suddenly the the city is transformed. Suddenly your bike ride is is a thing of joy, and and not a not a, a competition the way the way it is when you ride alone. So that explains uh, why it's so popular. Uh, the, the, the police have cooperated with the ride, deciding not to stop these, these people, uh, deciding also to get them out of downtown as quick as they could. That was their philosophy. And in order to do that, they, they blocked the cross traffic so that cyclists didn't have to stop at their red lights, thinking they'd just get us out of town quickly. And uh, that policy backfired on them because uh, the ride got too big, and they were ending up stopping uh, cross traffic for you know, as long as half an hour, 45 minutes sometimes, when 5,000 people show up on the ride. So. Um, the, they had to change their policy. They did so very poorly, uh, didn't coordinate it very well. And, and in July, as a lot of people might know, uh, 7,000 cyclists were out on the streets without uh, any uh, police support, with the police not doing what they had said they were going to do and not mediating between um, the few motorists who, who uh, went berserk and, and, and illegally and incredibly dangerously ran into cyclists and the few cyclists who uh, 
e illegally and stupidly and rudely uh, you know, got in the way of a, of a few motorists. Um, it got kind of ugly. But it made the point to policymakers that, that uh, you know, these people are, are serious, uh, that 7,000 people showed up to fight for their rights. And, and that's just a fraction of the people in the city who, uh, who care about that. And the cyclists, on the other hand, and pro probably more importantly, frankly, realize that there are tens of thousands of us. It's not just me alone that I want to have a bike lane, but it's tens of thousands of us in this city. And the city's doing nothing to make it safe for us. Uh, we know how much fun it is to ride a bike, and we know that, that thousands and thousands of people would join us on our bikes and improve the city for everyone and improve their own health, uh, improve the air quality, improve the congestion, uh, get the cars out of the way of other car drivers, uh, and do all those things if the streets were made safe. Um, but the city's not doing it. Um, we realize now that we're, we're, we're enough to be reckoned with, and, and I think the city is starting to um, you know, pay some mind. Critical mass, one Friday a month, but there are bicycles out there every day of the month. What else can we do to help out the bicyclists? Um, one of the things that, that we are doing uh, at the Bike Coalition is taking advantage of the politicians uh, realizing the urgency of our issues and pushing for some very specific improvements. Uh, bike lanes, extra space uh, on the streets, and uh, I think most importantly traffic calming. Uh, in a lot of residential uh, streets that are, are not arterials, are not designated as arterials, motorists use them as arterials anyway because the arterial perhaps is backed up or just because they feel like it, because they prefer to bike on, on, a, on a quiet, uh, because they prefer to drive on a quiet residential street. Uh, well, that's the same street that lots of families with lots of young children live on. Uh, and, and kids, until they get to a certain age, cannot be taught not to run into the street after a ball. They, it's, they're not cognitively able to do that. And, and because motorists are, are screaming through these residential streets at 30, 35, 40 miles an hour, uh, kids are getting killed. Kids riding their bicycles on residential streets all over the country are getting killed because we have not uh, made the street design appropriate for its use, which is uh, multiple uses of including lots of children riding around on bicycles or crossing the street, or seniors crossing the street who can't cross very quickly. Uh, you know, um, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, and, 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 and adult bicyclists who, who uh, you know, have to cut across traffic to make left turns and, and uh, th you know, things like that that are difficult to do when you have people speeding by at 35 miles an hour. Uh, if we slow those speeds down to, to, to 20, a uh, more reasonable speed for, for, you know, quiet residential streets, then, then uh, you know, th then we can save some lives. Um, that traffic calming is probably our most promising, um, promising avenue of activism. Okay, and you say it benefits not just the commuter bicyclist, but pedestrians trying to cross the street, kids on bikes? Yeah, yeah, it benefits uh, homeowners and, and, and residents of the, of the people who live there. It benefits uh, um, pedestrians, it benefits children, it benefits bicyclists. Uh, and it doesn't even uh, inconvenience motorists, uh, because these streets are not streets that you're supposed to be using as through streets anyway. They're, they're supposed to be local service streets that, that you know, you're only going a few blocks anyway, so why can't you go 20 miles per hour or 15 miles per hour? Uh, traffic calming has been shown to reduce uh, injuries to pedestrians from 50 to 75 percent, uh, or by 50 to 75 percent. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's a very cheap way to, to save a lot of people a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous that the city has done almost none, almost no traffic calming. We're talking with John Katz, who's Capital Projects Planner with the San Francisco Municipal Railway. San Francisco Municipal Railway, also known as? Muni, to the population here. We're the uh, transit, the basic transit provider for San, City of San Francisco. Our system includes cable cars, light rail vehicles, historic vehicles, uh, trolley coaches, and diesel buses of various sizes. And the only thing you wouldn't include would be what? The only other public transit entity here in the city that operates is BART, which is a separate district. In the last few years, you've been building something called Key Stops. What's a Key Stop? Well, a Key Stop is part of a federally mandated program uh, by the Americans with Disabilities Act that basically says that every transit system in the country that has a rail system, in our case a light rail system, must establish certain stops that are accessible for people with disabilities uh, that are known as Key Stops. This is roughly one out of every three or four stops in your system on the surface. All our stops, in the, are, some of them are underground. Those are already accessible through elevators. Um, 
On the surface, though, we needed to construct basically these uh, key stop configurations, which have uh, three components. They have a low level, what we call safety or boarding island for, the, for general boarding. They also have a ramp and platform for boarding for people with wheelchairs so they can access the floor level of the streetcars. Um, uh, to build these, uh, these key stops, we often had to change the parking, streetscape, uh, narrow sidewalks, make a lot of other changes to the existing built, built environment in the city, which created some concerns in the neighborhoods. We tried to work with the neighborhoods and basically we arrived at a good compromise solution in most cases. Right. Yeah. And these benefit the general public as well as those that need the extra help? Cor correct, because we, we understand our mandate for accessibility is not just for people in wheelchairs. We have a lot of uh, seniors, elderly people with, with walking disabilities who aren't necessarily in wheelchairs. We have low vision people who also benefit greatly from the fact that we've established these safety islands and also the general population who no longer have to basically get on and off the streetcar directly onto the street, often with an active traffic lane to the right of the streetcar, which can cause serious accidents and has, in fact. How close are you coming to being finished with the project? Well, basically, we started out with uh, 15 uh, key stops to construct all over the city. We've got right now 10 of them open, five more. The other five should be open by the end of this year, with one more actually will open in mid-1998, uh, which is a much more complicated intersection. And, and I guess it's mostly cities with older systems that have to worry about this. Who else is worried about key stops? Well. Our cities, uh, cities such as Philadelphia, Boston, and here in San Francisco, we have older light rail systems that were still maintained after a lot of the other systems are all around the country were torn out in the 50s, which was a big tragedy, but that's a whole story in of itself. But our systems still run on these basically relatively narrow residential streets with no structures to get people to facilitate getting on and off the streetcar. Um, so our three cities in particular are, are constructing uh, structures such as the key stops here in the city where we essentially build a safety island ramp and platform where nothing had existed before as part of the key stop program. We're talking with Larry Moore who's a senior civil engineer with the city of San Jose streets and traffic department. What has been San Jose's experience with traffic calming? Uh, San Jose has had a uh, very extensive experience with uh, traffic calming efforts. Most recently, however, we have uh, not really been in the business except uh, on a limited basis, uh, mainly due to uh, economic considerations. Uh, you know, with the recession, we've had continued cuts. But starting about 10 years ago, or maybe even a little further back, we had an entire unit dedicated towards uh, dealing with traffic calming issues. Uh, primarily, we were dealing with speeds, accidents, and cut through. And uh, we actually passed a city council policy that laid out step by step how you are to deal with neighborhoods who uh, complain about uh, speeding and cut through problems in their neighborhoods, and also how to uh, prioritize them. In other words, how which one you do first, second, third, and fourth, and so forth. So. Basically, uh, we uh, looked at everything. This, the, we were quite open. Uh, we would work with a community, uh, typically upwards, I think, maximum of maybe 2,000 to 2,500 homes was our largest study area. And we would look at all streets within, within an area, dealing primarily with the, with the problem streets, and w would form a, um, uh, an action team from the community. And we would meet on a regular basis uh, in a structured format to identify what the problems were and then go through a step-by-step -step analysis. Uh, we would come up with a plan and then would ultimately install the plan in the field, test it typically for about six months, and in a couple of instances we actually had to go back and do two more iterations and test it for uh, another, a total uh, of another year with the two different sets of refinements until such time as the neighborhood residents were satisfied uh, with the, the effects. Uh, we had to, to satisfy the individuals who originally complained about the problem because of the impacts on cut through or speeding. And we also had to deal with the remaining uh, neighborhood because the kinds of 
uh, installations that we did, which are typical traffic calming kinds of things, which are chokers, diverters, semi-diverters, uh, closures, uh, um, uh, bollards and signs that indicate that you're entering a, a residence district, traffic circles. Uh, we use just about uh, road bumps. We just we use just about everything uh, that we could in an area to be effective as we could while minimizing the impact on the surrounding area. But of course, anytime you you remove traffic or affect traffic on a particular roadway, it's like squeezing a balloon, you know, the, it, it pops up yeah. somewhere else. And so that's uh, what we had to do, uh, is figure out what those impacts were going to be ahead of time. And uh, obviously that's predicting human behavior, and, and uh, that's why we had to typically go through several iterations, because most of the time we were correct, but we were never 100% correct, and there were always that uh, end of the balloon would pop up somewhere that we would have to take care of. Uh, Dealing with traffic calming uh, on such a large uh, basis is extremely expensive, um, very time consuming. Each neighborhood of a size like that will take at least two years to deal with before you've solved the problem. Obviously you have maintenance issues to consider once you have installed all of these systems in place. And then finally, typically what you do when you have a situation like this is you are setting certain elements of the neighborhood against each other. <clears throat> the people who have the problem want to get rid of it, and the people who don't have the problem on either side don't want to have it relocated onto their streets. And so oftentimes you wind up with a polarized neighborhood. So that's one of the major considerations in dealing with something like this. Uh, we don't do those kinds of neighborhood studies anymore just because of the, the extensive nature and their, their cost and the maintenance. We will do a uh, street by street basis and typically we don't use um, active devices. We try to use passive devices wherever possible. Working in concert with our police department, for instance, um, if someone is using a little elbow street to get around a very busy intersection, we might restrict uh, turns during certain times of the day, but we would only restrict those turns that didn't affect the people who live down the street you know, from getting to and from their houses. And so it's typically in the morning we're more effective uh, at reducing cut through traffic. So uh, we still do uh, traffic calming efforts, but on a very limited basis. About the only device that we will install in a neighborhood are road bumps. And we use road bumps as a last resort. We have a policy uh, in the city that says when you have exhausted all enforcement and all engineering efforts, and you still have a demonstrated uh, speeding problem, then you can look into using uh, road bumps. And our road bump policy and, and uh, procedures are somewhat based upon uh, ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineer, uh, recommended practices, although we have modified ours, obviously, to suit you know, specific San Jose circumstances. We're talking with Tom Fox, who's coordinator of school safety with the San Jose Police. What are the different roles that the police have in school safety? Well, uh, uh, our role uh, primarily is uh, hiring uh, the crossing guards uh, to make sure that uh, children arrive at school safely. Uh, we also uh, train and help support uh, student safety patrols at the uh, various elementary schools. And uh, uh, we go in uh, to uh, different elementary and middle schools and provide education programs for them. Getting a new adult crossing guard, what are you looking for and what sort of training do they go through? Well, basically uh, what we're looking for is uh, someone who uh, likes uh, working with children uh, and is willing to, to work on a part-time basis. Uh, uh, training isn't necessary because we have uh, our own pretty intensive training program. Uh, they do have to pass a background check uh, because they're uh, working with kids, but generally that's not a problem. And the, the school safety patrols then, what, what age of students uh, form the patrols? Uh, the, uh, the patrols are made up uh, mostly of fifth and sixth graders uh, for the, uh, the uh, first, or first through uh, sixth grades. Uh, they're generally the older kids. And uh, uh, they work on uh, neighborhood streets uh, that are really not too busy and are always within uh, sight uh, supervision of their uh, school uh, liaison person. 
And then you do go into the schools uh, for safety education. Uh, how does that work? Uh, what we primarily want to do when we go into the schools we, is uh, we want to uh, teach the kids uh, uh, things about stranger danger, uh, what a stranger is, uh, how to uh, protect themselves by walking in groups of at least two, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we also uh, emphasize a lot of bicycle safety and try to educate them about, about wearing a bicycle helmet properly and uh, what some of the other laws are uh, in regard to that. Uh, in addition, we want them to cross in crosswalks uh, and uh, uh, if uh, and when they do, if, if they don't uh, cross in crosswalks, uh, we want them to uh, uh, be careful and look both directions and behind them to make sure that uh, what they're doing is safe for them. Young children, what type of mistakes do they tend to make that you're trying to keep them from making? Uh, children have a uh, short attention span. Uh, generally, uh, they get uh, uh, easily distracted by their friends or other things and uh, may make quick looks out and, and uh, find it safe and, and get involved with their friends or something a couple minutes later and then step back out. So they, they need to focus and be alert uh, about what it is that they're doing at the time. And that's particularly uh, uh, important for not just for the pedestrians, but it's also important for the, uh, the student safety patrols that they be focused on, on the position that they're doing in, in trying to get the other little kids across the street safely. We're in Rockville, Maryland, where Falls Road crosses over Interstate 270. There are four ramps going on and off of 270 here that are free-flowing with all the problems that presents for pedestrians. But four of the ramps are controlled by signals. You're turning left onto or off of 270. And so there's a red arrow at one point in the phase when it's safe for pedestrians to cross the ramp. They've installed pedestrian signals so a pedestrian can tell when that phase is. Except on the crosswalk just behind me. If we're heading east, we have a pedestrian signal. We know when it's safe. But when it's time to head home heading west, there is no pedestrian signal. If we take a close look, we can tell it was planned to be there. They had the bolts to hold the pole. They just never put in the pole. If they'd forgotten to put in one of the green lights for automobiles, I suspect they would have gone and finished the job in a hurry. Someone would have noticed. It's been years since they completed this intersection. There's still no pedestrian signal. The final inspector needs to add pedestrians to his checklist. At the risk of sounding overly dramatic, I want to tell you that the fight that we are fighting here and talking about here is the fight for America's soul. People's values. We're talking about transportation. We're talking about land use stuff. We have all these numbers and charts and graphs. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about values. We're talking about the values that people have and how those are shaped by the environments that surround them, by the qualities of their communities. For the past 50 years, we've been building and creating suburban areas that reflect and reinforce the values of suspicion and isolation, and of disposable materials. We've been, in fact, creating and living in communities that are throwaway communities, disposable communities. Places sold as being carefree have turned out to be free of caring, not worth caring about. And it's our challenge to create places that are worth caring about, that are worth investing not just our dollars, but our hearts as well, that are worth bequeathing to our children. We've got a whole generation coming up now who know only the values of sprawl. What kind of values are they going to pass on to society? The values of the mall? The values of the freeway interchange? Is that the kind of legacy that we want to leave to future generations? In my experience, most suburban developers, 
left to their own devices, will continue to spew out the same kind of soulless uh, sprawl that we've seen for the past half century. It is only when citizens stand up and get organized and tell their elected officials what their vision is for the future that a different kind of future can be created for our communities. And if you stand up, and if you organize, change will happen. The people who are dealing out the Kmarts and the Walmarts and the Wearmarts want you to believe that there is no possible change, that your voice doesn't count. But we're here today to tell you that it does. Whether your, your contribution be small or large, the things that you do, the contributions that you make, the choices that you make, the investments that you make into your community, make it a more livable place and make a difference. And I'm here to tell you that because I know I've seen it happen. When we began battling the Western Bypass, we were told it was a done deal. Even our political friends told us, get out of the way. This thing is on grease. There's nothing that you can do to stop this thing. Thankfully, we didn't believe them. I'm happy and humble to be here today to tell you that I've danced on the bypass's grave. More importantly, I've witnessed the birth of a new paradigm in suburban development, a more livable, sustainable paradigm of suburban development in our community. Is our job complete? By no means. It never will be. But if we had not stood up, if we had taken the advice that had been given to us and just gotten out of the way, and not fought the forces of sprawl and listened to the forces of community, we could never be where we are right now. Oregon's former governor, the legendary Tom McCall, once said that heroes are not some figures set up against a red sky. They are, in fact, ordinary people who stand up and say, this is my community, and I want to make it better. And that, my friends, is what we've been doing here today. Thank you. For more information on LUTRAC, making the land use, transportation, and air quality connection, write to LUTRAC, 1000 Friends of Oregon, 534 Southwest 3rd, Suite 300, Portland, Oregon, 97204. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.